Yeah. All right, so it's two o three. Let me introduce John Morel from uh, Pacific Northwest National Lab. He's our backgrounds are. Uh, he's in charge of making sure we have an experiment that can detect dark matter and keeping the backgrounds low. So he tracks a lot of it. And uh, so let's hear from him what exactly he has in plan and how you make sure that we stay in track. Yeah, so I, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to speak today. Um, yeah, so I come at this from the perspective of, of backgrounds and how you can use those. Uh, the group here is much more involved in detector design and production, how you build the experiment. Um, so part of why I'm here is to try to get those two groups talking to one another and, and how do we improve our experiment as a whole. So uh, since this is a, a, was a seminar, as I, as I understood it, um, I am going to give some motivation for why we're searching for dark matter and the types of experiments superseding us, so I be one of them. Uh, but then I did want to take some time to talk about one of the main things that I'm here today and tomorrow to uh, group on and others on, one of our dominant backgrounds, uh, tritium, and how do we mitigate tritium as a, a background to our experiment. Uh, so just as a, uh, an outline, uh, I will start at the very highest level of what is dark matter, about how do we know it exists, what are some candidates, and then get into our specific experiment that we're working on, superseding a snow lab, um, and then sort of the, the detailed part of the talk, the technical side of the talk, uh, is talking about tritium, why it's a background source, why we know it's there, and then uh, some of the issues associated with, really this is a bunch of questions, uh, how is it produced in the detectors? What are the uncertainties associated with that? Uh, how do we measure and understand tritium in the detectors as we're uh, working to build the experiment? And then what can we do about it? Okay, so at the highest level, um, evidence for dark matter. Uh, this is astronomical observations, so uh, looking out at the universe. Uh, such things as non-uniformities in the cosmic microwave background radiation. Uh, gravitational lensing and galactic clustering, as well as rotation curves of galaxies, all point to there being additional mass in the universe uh, beyond what we can account for by looking at the, the light that we see coming from stars and galaxies. So I'll go through them just a little bit and uh, to tell you how each of them uh, tell us this. Uh, cosmic microwave background radiation. Uh, this is a, uh, a picture of the, uh, the microwave sky, uh, showing us the uh, light that uh, came, to, came to us uh, when the universe got to a point where light could free stream um, after the early parts of the, like, the, the Big Bang. Uh, and so prior to this time when this, this radiation was emitted, uh, all of the matter in the universe, the baryonic matter, the uh, electromagnetic matter, uh, was all interacting with one another. And so uh, what you expect at that time in sort of a vanilla model of the beginning of the universe is this to be smooth, uh, that they're not, not to be this speckling that you see. Uh, and what this tells us is that because we see this speckling, there must have been some other uh, matter that had gravitational influence early in the universe that was causing over densities uh, and thereby leading under densities throughout the universe. And so there was something besides the matter that we're familiar with, like this stuff, um, that interacts with light that was causing a, a gravitational uh, impact on the way matter was clumping through the universe. Looking at uh, things we're more familiar with, clusters of galaxies that you can see through our telescopes. Uh, here you see a cluster of galaxies uh, from the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, looking at pictures like this, we can infer uh, a couple of things about the gravitational mass that is present uh, in this photograph. Uh, if one just takes into account the, the mass from all the stars and the galaxies that you would see here, you can come up with a certain model for how these galaxies should move relative to one another, um, as well as the gravitational lensing that you would see from light being bent around this mass of stars here. Um, it turns out that the mass that you would attribute to the stars and the galaxies is not enough to account for the movement of the galaxies themselves and the magnitude of the gravitational lens that you see. Uh, just for fun, uh, the, the gravitational lensing effect 
um, described is basically you have some cluster of galaxies, there's some mass associated with all of those galaxies, um, and light from a further away galaxy will be bent by that gravitational mass. And we will see that as this distorted light ray uh, that's coming to us. Uh, and this is described by uh, the general theory of relativity. So the other is the, uh, so we have this picture and we say, okay, well, what, what mass would we infer uh, is actually present here? Um, so you can make models like this that say, well, what is the additional matter that must be present in addition to uh, the, the, star, the mass of the stars that we see uh, to account for the motion of the, of the galaxies and the, the gravitational incidence. So this is another example of there is some additional mass present here uh, that we cannot see observationally through uh, electromagnetic means, uh, but there's clearly some dark mass, dark matter, that's present here causing this gravitational effect. Uh, coming closer to home, uh, we can look at the, the motion of the stars themselves within galaxies. Um, and what you do is you actually uh, view galaxies edge on, so you'd be looking sort of up the page. Um, and you can tell the velocity of the stars based upon the, uh, the wavelength shifting of the light, whether they're moving towards you or moving away from you, blue shifted versus red shifted. And you can map out as a function of the distance from the center of the galaxy uh, the speed of the stars. And so that's what you see, a rotation curve as a function of distance from the center of the galaxy, the velocity of the stars. Uh, so the solid line is what is typically observed uh, for galaxies. But if you were to again use the stars as a counting, an accounting of all of the mass that is in the galaxy and uh, infer from that what the gravitational predictions would say for the uh, uh, velocity of the stars, you get this dashed line. So there's some additional mass that is pulling the uh, actual speed of the stars up to provide this rotation curve. And this was uh, verified through numerous observations by Vera Rubin early in the 1970s. Uh, looking at all of these edge-on galaxies and determining these rotation curves. Again, pointing to this idea that there is additional mass uh, in and around galaxies that we do not see with our telescopes. Uh, so we have these hypotheses uh, that form our theory for how the uh, universe evolved, uh, which includes dark matter, this additional mass, which we do not see, uh, galactic uh, dark matter and halos, uh, the large-scale structure simulations, which take into account how do we see the, the uh, evolution of uh, structure in the universe today from the Big Bang. Uh, you have to include some dark matter to be able to uh, have these large-scale simulations come out looking like something today. Um, and we'd like to understand that in terms of our, our particle theory. Uh, what is the mass composition of the universe, and is this dark matter something in our, our standard model of particle physics, or is it something? Uh, so this is sort of a rehash, uh, which I'll go through quickly. Um, this idea that there is some additional bulge of dark matter, you can start to see in this particular picture right now, uh, which is causing the, those uh, uh, rotation curves that we saw. Uh, there's large-scale uh, structure simulations, uh, which give us sort of a distribution of mass, uh, whether it's smooth or very tightly uh, clumped together throughout the universe. And we match that up with surveys of galaxies, such as the Sloan uh, Digital Sky Survey, um, and match these simulations of the evolution of uh, structure of the universe to what we see uh, around us. And so the, uh, the hypothesis is this concordance model of cosmology, uh, which we call lambda CDM. Lambda from the uh, lambda, that's the term uh, in general relativity, and the CDM being the, the cold dark matter which must be included to be able to make these uh, uh, large scale structure simulations produce a universe, a simulated universe that looks similar to what we have today. So with this uh, hypothesis, this concordance model of the universe, uh, we break the universe into different components in terms of its, uh, uh, its mass and energy. So this is the stuff that we're, we're well uh, aware of, the stuff that we know, normal matter. Uh, heavy elements is a very small fraction of the universe. Uh, neutrinos is significantly more. Stars is a significant part, but the free hydrogen um, helium is the dominant part of the normal matter mass of the universe. 
And we describe all of those things through our standard model of particle physics, which I'm representing with this little picture here, uh, the quarks, the leptons, the force carriers. So then there's these other two components, which we sort of know by implication, um, but we don't really understand exactly what they are. Uh, I've talked to you about the evidence for dark matter. I've touched not at all dark energy. That is a, a totally different talk that someone else will have to give. Uh, but I'll be focusing on how we hope to understand uh, and learn about what this dark matter complex is. Okay, so what do we know about dark matter? We know it's weakly interacting at best. It has no electromagnetic interactions. We don't see it visibly or through x-rays or gamma rays or radio signals, any of our telescopes. Uh, it's not seen in nuclear reactions or in accelerators. Uh, we do know it's massive. This is the whole point about it being a, uh, a gravitationally active uh, material. Uh, and that's what the astrophysical observations point towards. And we know that it's clumpy both in the early universe and now. Uh, it's non-relativistic. Uh, and so we give it a name. Uh, in one particular case, WIMPs, weakly interactive mass particles. I should point out that there are others, in particular axions, um, other candidates for dark matter. So we want to know, is this dark matter part of the standard model of particle physics? Um, is this something that we're already familiar with and just haven't uh, attributed correctly? And so here's my little rubric for describing the standard model particles. Um, and I'll just go through very quickly uh, you know, how we know that it, the dark matter is not a, a standard model particle. Uh, what we know about it is it's massive, so it can't be one of the uh, uh, massless uh, particles of the standard model. We know it's stable, so it can't be any of the uh, heavier quarks or heavier leptons, massive leptons. There's no strong interactions from uh, uh, that we see from particle accelerators or nuclear interactions, so it can't be these. And we know there's no electromagnetic interactions, so there's not electrons, which leaves uh, apparently the neutrinos. Uh, however, the neutrinos are so light that they're relativistic, and we know that dark matter is in some sense clumpy uh, and non relativistic. So we know that uh, dark matter, whatever it is, is not part of the standard model of particles. So when we discover dark matter and understand what it is, we will be finding for ourselves a non-standard model particle. All right, so let's move now to uh, how we search for uh, dark matter. I'm going to be talking uh, specifically about low mass flimps in the super CDMS experiment. But to be complete, um, current searches for dark matter uh, sort of uh, populate three different regions, uh, or three different types. Uh, high mass WIMPs. Uh, this is typically uh, a candidate for supersymmetry particle theories, uh, typically of the TEV mass range. Um, and it comes out of supersymmetry's natural energy scale. So this is a, a candidate for a high mass dark matter point. Uh, asymmetric dark matter suggests an alternative, a low mass wind like particle, uh, which would be on the sort of the scale of the proton mass, uh, typically of sort of the 5 GeV mass scale. And this number 5 really comes from the fact that there's a Factor of five difference uh, between the mass of normal matter, those things that I showed you up on the, the, the top, the uh, hydrogen and helium, uh, compared to the, the 26% that uh, is dark matter. So this factor of five is sort of this idea that uh, there's five times as much dark matter as normal matter, and so you would say, well, the mass of dark matter is roughly five times higher than normal matter. If dark matter and normal matter are somehow very similar to one another, but just have different interaction mechanisms. Uh, another candidate for dark matter is axions, uh, which is actually a very specific solution to the strong CP problem in QCD. Uh, and this is a very different type of dark matter um, and is being searched for with uh, uh, a different method than uh, the types that I'll be describing uh, in the rest of the presentation. So um, I won't talk any more about axions really in this presentation, but uh, keep in mind that there's an alternative particle out there uh, that could, be, could, poti could potentially be the, the dark matter. So as I said, I'll be focusing on, on low mass research. Um, so getting to the specifics of uh, sort of the, the current generation of uh, US funded uh, dark matter experiments, these are sort of uh, large scale experiments that the Department of Energy um, is supporting for the development of next generation uh, dark matter experiments, so called generation two. Uh, there's two WIMP dark matter experiments that have been selected to, uh, to go to a larger scale. Um, LZ, 
which is really searching for high mass swims and super CVMS, and I'm just sort of giving the definition of how our names came about here. Um, and then there's a third experiment, um, which has also been selected uh, in this generation two, AVMX, and this is an experiment that's looking for those axions that the other type of carbon pool. Uh, so I will be talking uh, from sort of here on out about super CVMS Snow Lab um, and some of the specifics of uh, that experiment. I do want to give an introduction to how we uh, look for with dark matter, um, how we hope to detect dark matter, and how we interpret results. Um, and then I won't talk about both of these experiments I really just focused on. Uh, so the reason we believe that we can detect dark matter directly um, is because we know from um, sort of our ideas about the theories of the, the beginning of the universe that there should have been an exchange between dark matter and standard model particles uh, in the early early parts of the universe when everything was in uh, thermal equilibrium. Um, and so this is this interaction of dark matter going to standard model particles uh, in the early universe. Uh, and this is actually how, for those who are familiar with uh, how we search for dark matter, indirect detection experiments look for, for annihilation of dark matter producing standard model particles. Uh, if you were to look at colliders, you're slamming together standard model particles and looking for dark matter coming out. Well, actually, you're looking for the missing mass associated with dark matter. The direct detection experiments where we're searching for these halo, uh, galactic halo particles directly, um, is trying to measure the scattering of dark matter off of standard model particles, i.e., uh, you know, protons, neutrons, electrons, and our detectors. Uh, the dark matter goes on its way, but hopefully we see the outgoing standard model particle and the stuff that we make our detectors out of um, acquiring some energy. Uh, so what does that look like? Very schematically, you have some block of material you call your detector. Uh, you look for uh, the process whereby dark matter hits something in your detector. You measure some recoiling uh, nucleus or particle in your detector, and it produces uh, heat or light. Um, or ionization within your detector and you read that out. Dark matter goes on its way, but you measure this reaction uh, processing detector. Uh, these WIMP detection experiments are all done deep underground um, because of the need to shield yourself from cosmic rays. Uh, you have protons and other uh, uh, heavier nuclei hitting the top of the atmosphere producing secondary cosmic rays, which I'll just refer to as cosmic rays uh, in the rest of this presentation, um, streaming down, striking things on the Earth. Uh, you need the Earth's overburden to be able to shield yourself from all of these particles that would otherwise be generating events in your, your experiment. So here's a number of the different locations where experiments are performed. Uh, the LZ experiments at uh, Home State or the uh, Sanford Underground uh, Research Facility in South Dakota. Super CMS Snow Lab will be in Sudbury, uh, which is a, a bit deeper. Okay, uh, so just briefly, um, this idea that you have some block of material as your detection mechanism, you have ways of trying to read out the interaction of dark matter, either measuring the heat that's deposited from the interaction, any ionization that's generated uh, during the event, or uh, light that's produced because of the energy that's deposited. Uh, and there's a number of different techniques that are used to uh, uh, explore searching for dark matter. Uh, Super CDMS Snow Lab looks at both uh, the heat signature as well as the ionization signature. Uh, LZ looks at both the ionization and the light emission signature. Okay, so how do we compare experiments? Uh, this is the notional plot. I believe this is actually from uh, a few years ago now. Um, but I just want to describe what we're looking at in terms of how we compare our experiments when we're searching for the dark matter signal. Uh, this is the, uh, the x-axis is the mass of the wind. Uh, how heavy is that dark matter particle? And the vertical axis is the interaction cross-section between uh, wimps and nucleons. And so when we draw our experiments uh, uh, results, any sort of scooped out line that you see here is a statement that had there been a dark matter particle of given mass with an interaction cross-section of a certain amount, if it had been in this region, we would have seen it with this experiment. So this area is excluded. Um, there have been a number of experiments, of which I was on one, um, that saw potential signatures of dark matter that have, have uh, in time, been shown to not be uh, actual dark matter detection. 
uh, excluded by other experiments. Uh, this is typically the sorts of things when you see uh, an unknown background creeping into your experiment, something that you were not expecting uh, appearing and confusing you as to whether or not you would potentially see a dark matter uh, interaction with your detector. Um, and so this is the game that we play where we are trying to not be fooled by backgrounds, um, and yet sometimes we are, but uh, progress uh, uh, proceeds, experiments go on and check that, and say, well, did they really see something? No, they did not, because other experiments have been able to exclude those regions. Uh, it is worth pointing out, there is this uh, dashed line here. Uh, this is the neutrino floor. This is going to be a limit in terms of how deep uh, experiments can search in terms of uh, the interaction cross-section between blimps and nucleons uh, before neutrinos from the sun um, and atmospheric neutrinos become the dominant uh, interaction mechanism, which will become sort of a, a limiting background that we will not be able to get rid of. Uh, so all of this white area here, here, this is the future search area for doing uh, limb detection. So in terms of uh, how you build the experiments, uh, typically you increase your detector mass, you add the number of target nuclei, your uh, experiment to be able to gain in sensitivity to smaller and smaller interaction cross sections. And uh, this is not quite right, but uh, the, as you go down in wet mass, you need to have more sensitive detector systems. Uh, you need to be able to be responsive to very low energy depositions in your detector systems. Uh, and so lowering the threshold of your experiment allows you to be able to reach down to lower mass WIMPs. You'll notice that in this uh, figure, most of the searching thus far has been done in this high mass region. This is the sort of uh, supersymmetric particle. Uh, but this low mass region, sort of below 10 GeV, uh, this is sort of the area for an asymmetric dark matter particle. This has not been searched as well. Uh, and this is the area where super CMS snow lab would be going. Uh, just visually, this notion of sensitivity and threshold, um, if you think of a nucleus as being a big uh, uh, bowling ball, the recoil that you measure from that depends upon what strikes it. Uh, so a high mass dark matter particle would give a certain kick once it hits the bowling ball, um, whereas a lower mass particle, some PV size thing uh, in terms of mass, would give this very small recoil from the, uh, of the nucleus. And that's what we're trying to measure. You know, imagine trying to observe a BB bouncing off of a, uh, a bowling ball by observing the bowling ball rolling away after this interaction. Uh, you can imagine that there's not much of an impact to the bowling ball if that was all you were able to see. So that's the challenge. Uh, so we have this map where we're pursuing, uh, you know, looking for dark matter interactions on our detectors here and here. And the Super CDMS collaboration, of which uh, I'm a part and uh, Bob and others are a part, uh, is searching for a low mass swims with uh, a detector system that we're developing uh, to put into the uh, snow lab uh, in Sudbury, Ontario. So, what does that experiment look like? Uh, it's a cryogenic experiment uh, operated at uh, milli Kelvin temperatures, where we'll be operating. Uh, crystals of germanium and silicon inside of a, uh, a nested cryostat of cans that allows us to bring these detectors down to very cold temperatures. Uh, this is what allows us to be able to measure the heat signature um, of the dark matter interactions in the detectors. Um, and then the detectors themselves are designed in such a way that we are able to measure the ionization that's produced uh, from the interactions of dark matter with the nuclei and detectors as well. Uh, much of the uh, outer parts of what you see here are shielding to shield the detectors themselves from the uh, uranium, thorium, and other radioactive isotopes that are naturally present in the uh, cavern that surrounds this uh, experiment. This experiment is located, as I said, in the uh, uh, Snow Lab uh, experiment deep underground. Uh, and we need to shield these detectors from uh, sort of the radioactivity in the surrounding <coughs> cavern to be able to see these very uh, infrequent interactions of dark matter with normal matter. Um, the materials themselves have to be very pure so that uh, uh, there's no uh, uranium, thorium, and other radioactivity, ice, radioactive isotopes uh, in the construction materials of the detector itself. 
providing a very radioactivity free environment for the uh, detectors to operate inside the, the cryostatosphere. Uh, so that's the main goal. And uh, this is not uh, new in some sense. The uh, collaboration uh, has worked for uh, more than a decade with these cryogenic detector systems. Uh, this is a picture of detectors at the uh, Sudan underground uh, laboratory, uh, which is in Minnesota. Uh, five towers of uh, detectors uh, operated um, in this way as uh, cryogenic detectors allowing, in, allowing uh, for the measurement of uh, the heat ionization from the interactions of dark matter. So you get a sense of scale of uh, this picture here. So much of uh, uh, what the design of Super CMS uh, at Snow Lab uh, is based upon scaling up uh, this technology and the detectors to uh, search for greater sensitivity to, to low mass dark matter. Now there's two different types of detectors uh, that are planned for uh, Super CDMS Snow Lab. Uh, the so-called high voltage detector. Um, the way that this detector operates is by using an effect uh, known as a negative loop phonon production as sort of a gain effect. Um, here you've, what you've done is you've taken your crystal, uh, which is operated at uh, millikelvin temperatures. You have some interaction that's produced in the uh, uh, bulk of the crystal, which produces uh, both heat and ionization initially, uh, but with a large potential field, a large voltage across the detector, uh, the ionization charge, uh, the ionization carriers, in some sense are dragged through the crystal. And in doing so, you produce additional phonons. You're essentially uh, taking the movement uh, through this potential field and putting energy into uh, the phonon channel. Uh, and so as you pull the ionization charge carriers through the crystal with this potential field, you create a gain effect in the, uh, the number of phonons that are uh, measurable due to uh, this interaction. Uh, and so in this way, you're actually using the detector in such a way that you're making a phonon measurement of the initial ionization charge. Uh, and so this allows you to be able to do a uh, low noise, very sensitive measurement of the ionization read out using a, 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 a low noise phonon channel uh, through a uh, transi transition lens sensor. Uh, and the amount of uh, gain that you get comes from this uh, voltage potential uh, in the equation for the number of uh, total phonons produced uh, in the detector. Uh, so what this allows you to do, and what has been demonstrated at uh, the Sudan underground laboratory, um, is the very low energy thresholds that one is able to measure uh, uh, energy depositions in the crystals using this uh, high voltage detection technology. Uh, here you see an energy scale. Uh, this is X-ray energy scale. So X-rays are at uh, you know a few keV, and the threshold for uh, this detector uh, was you know down far below one keV, down in the hundreds of uh, electron volts uh, able to see in shell x-rays uh, uh, as a background in the experiment. And uh, what we're looking for in terms of doing a dark matter search is looking for any additional accounts, any additional events counts uh, between these x-ray peaks that would not be attributed to some background but some uh, like dark matter signal which would appear as a some kind of an exponential shape uh, of, of events uh, in these very low low threshold detector systems. Uh, the one thing that this ex, uh, this detector design cannot do, uh, it can't discriminate between nuclear recoils and electron recoils. Uh, and so in this sense, we're blind to whether or not the uh, interaction was due to a gamma ray or a dark matter particle or a neutron. Uh, and so, Although this gives us the best sensitivity in terms of uh, threshold performance, um, it's in some sense a little bit blind to the type of interaction that we're looking for, which is a dark matter interaction with uh, this um, and producing a nuclear recoil. However, uh, the other type of detector, the ISIN detector, uh, uses the same substrate, germanium or silicon in a crystal form, uh, but now the uh, the layout of sensors is such that you have the ability to uh, distinguish uh, the electron recoils from the nuclear recoils 
um, and be able to also distinguish uh, bulk versus surface events. And the way this is possible is having a small voltage uh, across the crystal um, and allowing for the initial phonons and ionization to be the dominant signals uh, coming from the interaction. Uh, with the small voltage, you don't produce additional loop, or you don't produce many additional loop phonons, and so you can measure the, the difference between the uh, initial uh, phonons from the initial interaction from the initial ionization uh, uh, charge carriers. Um, and uh, this Isaac detector does not have as low an energy threshold, uh, but allows us to be able to do this discrimination between the two type of detectors and allows us to do uh, better fiducialization of surface versus bulk um, reconstruction. And so this allows us to be able to understand our backgrounds better in terms of uh, how we do the experiments. What is this energy threshold? Uh, in the next, uh, the next design, we hope that it will be below 1 kV. Um, but uh, you know, typically, it's like in you know, the single kV. And the other one? The, uh... So that one's targeting like 100 kV. So, so just quickly, uh, how does one do this in terms of using the ISIPs to be able to distinguish uh, different recoil types? Uh, this is what it looks like in terms of doing an analysis. Uh, you have some total recoil energy that, that you've measured essentially through the, the phonon channel. Um, and then you compare that with the amount of ionization yield that you get from the interactions that you measure the, the ionization charge carriers. Um, and what you have from neutrons is the recoil interactions and what you have from electron recoils by uh, gamma rays, x-rays, and photons. Uh, you get this difference in the amount of ionization yield, a uh, higher ionization yield from, from photons. So in this way, you can distinguish these two different types of backgrounds. Uh, this is a calibration uh, for neutrons, uh, as well as the, uh, the, the barium-133 gamma rays that you see here. Uh, you take away these neutrons from the calibration source, and you go looking for dark matter interactions in this window, and you ignore any backgrounds that you see up from uh, natural radioactivity. Okay, so uh, back to this figure where we compare uh, the different experiments. Uh, Super CDMS Snow Lab uh, is searching in this area here, this low mass wimp region, essentially going after this asymmetric dark matter candidate. Uh, and then as I said, there's these two different types of detectors on two different substrates. That produces four curves, uh, the red curves being the Isaac curves curves being, um, oh, sorry, sorry, the uh, red curves being germanium, both high zip and uh, high voltage. Uh, since the high zips don't have as good a threshold performance, they don't go as low in, in energy sensitivity, they can't reach the lowest masses of limb sensitivity as high voltage detectors do. Uh, the ability to have both silicon and high voltage and germanium, silicon and germanium detectors allows us to directly compare, uh, you know, the interaction properties of, of dark matter with different so it's this area where we're going after uh, sensitivity to, to low mass dark matter particles with super CMS. All right, so now we're going to start getting into more of sort of the technical um, parts of this talk. Um, here's our background budget split up into electron recoils versus nuclear recoils. It turns out that for low mass swim searches, the electron recoil background is what dominates, especially in the high voltage detectors where you don't have discrimination. And what I'll be focusing on uh, in the rest of the talk is the dominant background, which is uh, this bulk detector contamination, which is really uh, cosmogenic production of tritium in the crystals themselves. Okay. So what is the, the evidence that tritium will be a background for these uh, germanium-based detectors? The first hint came from the IJEX neutrinus dull beta decay experiment. It wasn't really strong evidence. In my opinion, I was very skeptical that this was really tritium. Uh, the spectrum that you see experimentally measured is red. And uh, this blue curve here is a bi eye fit from uh, a paper by uh, uh, Domi May and uh, collaborators. Basically saying, well, if this is, uh, if this part of the spectrum from IJEX is due to tritium, what would the amount of tritium in that detector be? And so they did an assessment of uh, this um, spectrum and said, well, if this is truly tritium, then we would have an expectation that uh, about 30 uh, tritium 
nuclei you produce per kilogram per day uh, due to exposure from cosmic rays. Uh, so what's happening here? You build your uh, germanium detector above ground. Uh, it's sitting there being exposed to cosmic rays. Uh, the neutrons, protons uh, from the cosmic rays are streaming down on these detectors and causing spallation, basically knocking protons and neutrons out of the germanium nuclei or the silicon nuclei while it's above ground. And some of those come out as, as tritons, as, as the, the tritium nuclei. Uh, and so this is the production rate for that. Here's some evidence experimentally of measuring that very low level of tritium production from spallation, cosmic ray spallation in the detector. Um, however, there's some evidence that this number is not right. Uh, one of our collaborators, um, Alan Robinson, dug through the sort of literature and said, you know, did they divide out by the number of exposure days correctly? And it didn't look like they did if you read between the lines of the number of reports about how this detector was fabricated and handled. So for some time, this was all the information that we had. Uh, this was the number that we were using try and understand what our tritium exposure would be. Uh, but this has recently been resolved by strong evidence uh, coming from the Edelweiss 3 dark matter experiment, where they clearly see the addition of a tritium uh, spectrum to their dark matter experiment. Uh, you can see the x-rays that I talked about. Uh, these are K-shell x-rays. Uh, they have a very similar detector design as Super CMS, uh, operating uh, millikelvin uh, uh, phonon ionization detectors. Uh, and uh, the thing to point out is, you know, here's the tritium beta decay endpoint at 18 keV, uh, age right there. This is definitely looking like a, uh, a tritium spectrum. So here is strong evidence that tritium is going to be a contributing background uh, to these uh, future generation dark matter experiments as as they improve and get larger. Uh, now that said. Um, Here's the result that comes from their analysis of the total exposure. Uh, so 20, yeah, sorry, 82 uh, tritium nuclei produced uh, per kilogram per day from exposure uh, to cosmic rays. Uh, but this remains uncertain. This is the figure that they show in terms of their fit that generates this number. Um, as you can see, the data points clearly fit the best fit line. Not really. Um, and so this is, in this presentation, as I go through, I'm going to be pointing out a lot of these areas where we have ideas about what the tritium production rate should be, but one should keep in mind that this is actually very uncertain. So a lot of what we're working with is not well-known information in terms of preparing for this next generation experiment. What is the variable saturation fraction? Uh, it, it's basically, um, if you left a crystal on the surface forever, the sort of saturation value because you have both uh, production of the tritium, but you also have the decay away of tritium. Um, that saturation, that saturation level, um, and so it's a it's a different way. You could you can think of it as time in some sense. Uh, as time increases, your saturation level goes up. Um, time at the surface. But, uh, but this is a, a better variable in, in terms of like actually mapping out how the tritium grows into the crystal because it's not just a linear thing. It's actually this this uh, curve, right? You get a lot of production and it starts to decay where you go. So there's actually like a, a non-linear um, response in terms of the total amount of tritium in the crystal. So the problem here is that the half-life of tritium is about 12 years. It's long, right. So it's long compared to our experiments. Um, <coughs> I, I actually think that this was probably unnecessary to present it this way because their exposures are actually short relative yeah. to that 12 years. In some sense there's value to getting the, the crystals underground as soon as possible because you're, 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 you're decreasing that background over time. Right, so from our perspective uh, it's a linear effect. Every day that we spend uh, on, on the surface is just a linear increase because we expect our total exposure to be short several you know, tens of days uh, compared to the 12 year half of the tree. So for us it's a linear effect. We're really uh, but the point I want to make here is that now we have strong evidence for treating the detectors but there's some large error bar and we should be aware that there's still uncertainty in what this production rate is. Uh, so just as a reminder, uh, I sort of just said this verbally, where does this tritium production in our detectors come from? 
It comes from all the secondaries, uh, protons, neutrons, uh, muon interacting in our detector crystals, uh, producing these uh, this spallation uh, induced tritium in our detectors. And so we want to know what can we do about that. Um, first thing we want to do is understand how this production happens. There's a number of dependencies. Uh, it depends about altitude, depends upon the geomagnetic cutoff, where you're located on the Earth, as well as solar activity. So these are all additional factors that uh, impact the production of tritium. So we can't just say, well, we put a detector on the surface for 10 days, the production is X. We can't just take that number 82 and just multiply out by the number of days. Uh, there is more to it than that. And all of these uh, uh, effects have some significant uncertainty associated with Are people actually building detectors in New York, or is that just an example? Uh, so New York is um, where some measurements were made uh, back in the 70s okay. uh, that sort of like everyone has pinned their data to in terms of like I compare to this paper where they made measurements in New York and I infer this okay. and so the the New York reference point is it's like that's what everyone refers to as being the point of reference and it, we, we go around and around in circles and talking about well should we refer to it as New York or the pole or the equator yeah it's, it's an issue um, Okay, so, so altitude, um, this is actually the, the, the best figure I can find uh, to, to show this. Um, so atmospheric depth, um, so the surface is essentially here deep within the atmosphere. Um, one thing, there's two things I like about this figure. This comes from PDG. Um, here's the data points that populate this figure. And look at all these curves. They, if they had the data to justify this figure, they would show the data points. And this is what they have. They have negative muons. That's it. All the rest comes from basically modeling what the, the production should be. Uh, so you can look at this and you say, this is the PDG. This is, you know, this is our Bible. This tells us what the world is like. Um, here's the data points that we have that justify this figure. <laughs> um, muons uh, are one way of measuring uh, cosmic ray production uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, you'll notice that they're essentially flat, nuanced to go through everything. Uh, but what we care about for production of tritium is uh, protons and neutrons, which have a very different uh, dependence upon atmospheric depth. So uh, this measuring muons is not a not necessarily a good uh, point of reference for trying to understand the, uh, the details of the proton neutron flux at a specific location on the Earth. Uh, dependency on geomagnetic location on the Earth. Uh, so this is uh, V cross B, uh, of course. Uh, so you have a, a charged particle, a proton, generally speaking, uh, coming towards the Earth. And if it sees the magnetic field uh, you know, at 90 degrees, it will be spun away. Uh, whereas if it comes in at the pole, uh, it's essentially uh, funneled down to the Earth. Uh, and so there are measurements of sort of the here it's the nucleon component at sea level um, as a function of geomagnetic latitude. Um, and you'll see that there is, of course, more near the poles and less near the equator. Uh, and so this is an effect that also impacts um, the, the production of tritium in our nuclei because the uh, neutrons and the protons are the ones that drive the experiment. Uh, so if Edelweiss 3 were to do all, of, had, had they done all of their detector production at the equator, it would be inappropriate to use their number if you were doing your detect detector production at the pole. Um, of course, that's not the case. Sort of everything is done at sort of the 40 degree or 45 degree um, geomagnetic latitude. Uh, geomagnetic latitude is not identical with the latitude that we see on the map. Uh, there's actually mappings of geomagnetic latitude, um, and it's not just circles around the Earth. Um, and so this is yet another area where uh, knowing where you are in geomagnetic latitude for a measurement of uh, tritium production in your medium makes a difference. And then you have to be able to understand how that is different from uh, one location to another. Uh, there's also a dependency uh, on the cosmic ray flux due to the solar cycle. Uh, here is the number of sunspots, and here is the uh, neutron number of neutrons counted. Uh, and you'll see there's basically an inverse relationship between uh, solar cycle um, and the peak of uh, the neutrons that you, you 
measure for cosmic rays. So again, if you have some measurement of production of tritium when the detector is above ground, say here, you would want to know whether or not you're producing your detectors down here. Uh, it appears that uh, the Edelweiss 3 detectors were produced sort of at this beginning of the tailing edge of cycle 24. We're going to be producing our detectors in the trough. We're going to have higher production. We need to try and understand this and, and uh, account for it in our predictions. Uh, now, the way that one might want to approach to do this is by saying, well, we, we can model what the flux of uh, uh, cosmic rays is um, and their secondary particles. Uh, I want to draw your attention to the uh, non-red lines. Uh, the red lines are cross-section values uh, where we're doing a study for uh, germanium, or for nutrients called beta decay. Uh, but the, the colored blue, purple, green, black, uh, those are four different um, characterizations of, of cosmic ray neutrons. Uh, the craziness that you see in the, the cry is due to uh, that uh, some binning that they had in the, uh, the simulation program, whereas the uh, Goldhagen and the Ziegler are basically semi-analytic functions. Um, I don't remember what the details of the HESS model are. Uh, but the point you should take away from this is uh, these are all different people trying to do their best to simulate what the uh, secondary cosmic ray spectrum would look like. Uh, this is a log log plot. Uh, there's quite a bit of variation between these, uh, these different models, and it's not clear which one of these is, is right. So trying to do a, a model where you say, I'm just going to take the cosmic ray uh, spectrum and convolve it with some cross-section uh, is also potentially quite dangerous. Uh, there are models out there for what the tritium production should be in germanium and silicon. Uh, so these are cross-section models. Uh, there are no specific data points that match this up uh, to, uh, to measurements. The sort of best data point you could have would be going to this uh, Edelweiss 3 data. Uh, so this is all coming from models of sort of like what we expect from nuclear physics. Uh, and so these aren't really backed up by uh, uh, experimental data that pins these values down. So again, an area where you're taking a uncertain uh, spectrum of uh, initial spallation producing products uh, and convolving them with a, a cross-section to produce tritium that is also not built into experimental data. The dump is the predominant uh, production mechanism from spallation coming through the neutron uh, covers. The dominant. I don't know the answer to that question. I mean, the data you showed was from neutrons, right? Yeah, so, no, so neutrons dominate the spallation uh, in nuclei. Um, the tritium is dominated by neutrons. Relative to protons and neutrons, yes. yes. I don't know if tritium in particular is the most likely. I would suspect hydrogen might be the most likely. Uh, well, actually, probably neutrons, but those just one around the building. Okay, so, so we have some choices here. So what do we do in terms of trying to make a prediction? Uh, we have this measurement from Edelweiss. We could just use this number and just say, okay, well, we have our detector on the surface for so many days. Just multiply through, uh, and that gives us an answer. That's the easy thing to do. Um, it folds together a lot of the uh, sort of independent variables of location, altitude, solar cycle. Uh, we just say, yeah, well, it's all washed out by the uncertainties in this plus or minus 20. Uh, the other uh, approach that people typically like to uh, approach is like from like a grad student or postdoc perspective. Well, I'm going to calculate it all. Uh, fully analytic methods or, or using some kind of Monte Carlo uh, gives you complete control of all the variables, but you're involving all these uncertainties that I've sort of pointed out about uh, experimental knowledge, uh, cross sections, uh, the spectra that are used. Uh, you're basically putting that all in and just trying to take it faith in the calculation that gives you something that is going to appropriately scale to things like actual measurements. Uh, there's a sort of a, a midway point between the two where you take this number but try to use your calculational methods to give you scaling ratios uh, to account for things like location and altitude and solar cycle. So you say things like, okay, if Edelweiss 3 uh, produce their detectors at the height of the solar cycle and we're going to be at the low of the solar cycle, then we should 
multiply by some factor to increase the production rate because of that. Um, this doesn't necessarily help you in terms of dealing with uncertainties, you still have that. Um, but you feel like you've done something to try to mitigate some of these other variables, independent variables in terms of the production. Uh, of course, the other thing to do is just to avoid the production of trivia. So I'm going to. John, is it, is it crazy to just do some of this development of these detectors at where we put telescopes, you know, where it's really high and really clear? So you would, in fact, get huge amounts of tritium. Made, so you get such a large rate you could measure it? So I don't talk about that here at all. Um, we are considering um, doing a measurement where we take a bucket, not even a detector, we take a bucket of germanium, so this is probably like the oxide, um, and put it in uh, a neutron beam like Lance. The Lance neutron beam at uh, Los Alamos looks very similar to the spectrum that you expect from uh, cosmic ray neutrons. Uh, you do a huge exposure. Right. Uh, then you take that bucket and you extract out all the, the hydrogen and tritium, and then you go and you put that into a proportional counter and you measure the tritium production. So there's a direct way of trying to get this, this cross section fully uh, taken care of to do, to do the, uh, the production rate uh, estimation. But I don't, I don't talk about that all here. Uh, so anyhow. Um, Here's an attempt, I had a summer student who looked at these scaling relationships. How do we scale uh, for solar maximum and minimum? What do we need to multiply by uh, for the various locations where Super CDMS is doing detector fabrication or testing? Uh, altitude makes a difference. There's a number of different models about how altitude makes a difference, uh, either by uh, particular uh, neutron proton muon or just sort of overall. Uh, so I've, uh, I've organized these by you know, how high above sea level they are in some sense. Um, the factor above sea level gives you the addition uh, as we do. So we don't want to leave our detectors out of snow lag. That's our, our highest, uh, highest production we can do at uh, uh, altitude elevation. Uh, one of the things, of course, that we want to look at is how do we mitigate the exposure just directly uh, for super CMS. Uh, we have a number of steps that go through in terms of producing the crystals, uh, polishing and shaping them, fabricating them, assembling them, testing them, and how much time that takes. Uh, we're particularly concerned about the high voltage detectors because they don't have the ability to discriminate the, uh, the electron recoil uh, beta decay from tritium, and so we're working to try and minimize the number of days. This column that you see here was sort of a first cut. What do we think we could do? Uh, a total of 99 days. Uh, we said, well, to give ourselves some breathing room, we give ourselves a uh, 120 days to try and do this. Uh, but we were we were asked to try and do better than that in our review process, and so we looked at how we could reduce this further. Uh, we felt we could take it down by a factor of two, uh, targeting a total exposure of 60 days. Um, this target of 60 days is what gives us that number of 24 that I showed in the background table earlier, uh, based upon basically. Uh, try and do everything we can to minimize the amount of time and exposure of each of those steps. Uh, now getting on to trying to understand how we might do other things uh, to reduce tritium, we could actually try to actively remove tritium. Uh, it turns out that a number of studies uh, early on in the, the days of understanding uh, germanium and silicon crystals, uh, how they operate both as detectors but also as uh, you know, uh, substrates for doing uh, uh, electronics, there are a lot of studies done on, on the properties of, of single crystal germanium uh, and so uh, Here's one particular design where they uh, float in hydrogen gas. This was a, uh, a crystal uh, that was grown in a very strange way, um, but uh, a germanium crystal that was grown uh, that had a, a, a volume, a cavity here in the center, and they basically were able to heat this up and uh, transport the hydrogen through the germanium uh, and then measure uh, with a mass spectrometer uh, the hydrogen. Mm. And so what they did was they would first bake this out, they would get to a, a you know, level of basically no response from the mass spectrometer to hydrogen. They would begin to flow the hydrogen gas. They would see an increase in the measurement of hydrogen with the mass spectrometer and they would turn it off and see it go back to zero. And they were using this to understand the, uh, the propagation of hydrogen through germanium crystals at temperature. 
this gives us a view on how we could use this same process to be able to manage the amount of tritium that's in the detector because it's essentially going to follow the same uh, thermodynamic and transport properties as the hydrogen. So the conclusion from this is that hydrogen diffuses through heated germanium crystals uh, and that they can be degassed to some degree. Now what this doesn't answer is do they then operate as, as uh, dark matter detectors? And that's part of what I'm here to talk with uh, uh, with Bob Kellers about how we, how we would test that. Uh, from my reading of this particular paper, it looks like pressure probably plays a, a role in the decision as well. A um, little bit more on this, uh, removing tritium uh, from crystals, germanium and silicon. Uh, there was a nice study about hydrogen in crystalline semiconductors, uh, germanium and silicon. Basically trying to understand how hydrogen in the crystals makes an impact on them as detectors. Uh, but again, they're doing this sort of thing where they're, they're heating the crystals and transporting hydrogen through the crystals. Uh, and they can talk about, they talk about how uh, the hydrogen exists in three different states within uh, silicon, bound to defect sites uh, as molecular uh, hydrogen, um, where it's stable, or atomic, which diffuses readily. Uh, the tritium will be in this atomic form, but will probably wind up being, uh, wind up being in one of these two states if it's allowed to, to, to migrate. Uh, the studies were done largely on silicon, but they believe that it's probably the same story for um, And in this literature search, uh, I found this one wonderful paper on the solubility and diffusion coefficient of tritium in single crystals of silicon. So this is exactly the kind of thing that we want to know. So this, I point this out for the grad students or postdocs. Um, you know, this was me spending an afternoon in the library. Uh, we have this joke at the at PML. Uh, six months in the lab will save you a whole afternoon in the library. Um, so, you know, this right here basically tells us that what we're thinking about doing in terms of actively removing tritium from crystals is not crazy. People put tritium into crystals to make measurements and they can take it out. We should be able to do the same thing. Will we get a dark matter detector? Well, that's the question. How hot? Yeah, so I didn't put that in here, but uh, they, they studied the diffusivity as a function of temperature. Um, and so you get on to, so they have some models for what the diffusivity should be, um, and they get onto that model above a certain temperature. So like it matches their model here, uh, but doesn't match their model there. I take that to mean that you should get to the point where you understand you know, uh, the diffusion as a, a thermodynamic process. That's how hot you want to be. It turns out that it's like 500 and 700 C for silicon and germanium. And you can infer that from reading the literature. Uh, so we already have targets for how hot we want to get. So the idea is that the reason you want to discuss is whether after fabricating detectors you can still remove the microphone uh, or say 500 C. Or even before fabrication. So at some point. You can no, but, but the, no, no, it should be after fabrication. Uh, Ideally after. Because the time you spend on testing these detectors is the largest. Yeah. Of the, you know, the so, so one thing that I, I didn't mention, um, I, know, I know from germanium ionization detectors, if there is no hydrogen, if you take all the hydrogen out of a crystal, it doesn't work as an ionization detector. So there is just the question of uh, would taking a crystal that we've prepared up to the point of putting the sensors onto it and then baking it, will it still then operate as a dark matter detector if you put the sensors onto it? Or do we need to put hydrogen back into the crystal? Why does it operate after you put the heat? But, so the hydrogen plays a role um, in filling the defects in the crystal, which allows oh. the, uh, the ionization charge to propagate. I see. Yeah. So, so you get traps. Those traps produce, right. Okay. So the hydrogen plays a role in managing those traps. Also, there's a thermal budget. You go above a certain temperature, you'll create one of those vacancies. Uh, yeah. Wait, new traps. Are, are we worried about the aluminum flaking off? Because it can actually limit the diffusion into the TES and the tungsten is pretty much. Because 500 degrees is germanium, put the vision of the germanium uh, temperature you're going to get hydrogen in the and the melting point of the building starting to approach the melting point of the building. So, that's the proportion. 500 is the proportion. Yeah. So, that's the first thing. So, you're going to have to We know dark matter exists. Uh, the experiment that we're working on is proceeding in a snow lab, searching for low mass wimps. Uh, tritium is going to be one of our dominant backgrounds. 
There's a lot of uncertainty associated with predicting, mitigating, and removing tritium. This is sort of the things that we're working on. Uh, ultimately, our goal is to get to the solar neutrino floor. Uh, this is going to be achieved not just through trying to understand this tritium background and mitigating it, uh, but likely also things like improving the detector design uh, and uh, sort of a combination of different uh, approaches to how we get to the, the, the ultimate goal of the neutrino floor. Um, so, thank you for your attention. Questions? Back out. Okay. Okay. Turn to the helium. Okay, sure. Turn that out. Uh, so, something else similar that, that might preferentially take up the spots that the hydrogen would otherwise. I sit. obviously don't know the answer to that question. Um, I know that for germanium ionization detectors, so we operate at nitrogen temperatures, uh, there's been plenty of studies about doping and, and traps and this sort of thing. I have never seen anything that suggests that there is a substitute. Uh, they are produced in germanium atmospheres. If they're not, they're produced in vacuum. They don't work. So you have to do them in. So they tend not to fit you out. Well, so that's the thing, that's right? The plan. That's the plan. That's, the plan. that's what we want to try and do is figure out a way where we can basically say, remove all the hydrogen and put clean, clean hydrogen back in. Will it work? Cure the tritium with it. And the question is, the later you do, uh, the better it is. But there's always benefit is of you don't if you can't survive the aluminum with that temperature, then you do it. Yeah, aluminum is tricky. So you don't want to get there. So you, I mean, there it is. You, if you remove it, like you showed today, if you remove it before fabrication, then you gain some. If you remove it after fabrication, then you gain some more. And so uh, sure. there are various points. One one concern I have is that in the the lit literature reading I did. I mean, this is very nice. They show that they can, quote unquote, degas germanium from degas the germanium crystal uh, with respect to hydrogen. But I asked myself, is this really an absolute zero? You know, did they actually remove all the hydrogen, or is there some residual amount that you know, is like a baseline that's going to stay? In I don't know the answer for that. We do a very careful approach. Make various devices, see if this can perform hydrogen. The underground uh, cost wise, yes, but it's another thing that we're considering. Um, yeah. Ten million dollars we came up with a budget. Wow. We to set up on the ground mm. <laughs> <laughs> And finally, the entire country of volunteers to live underground. Yeah. I'm sure people don't want to test those things. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, Any other? Questions? Really? No, oh, sorry, guys. Oh. Yeah, no, 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 this is not a question, this is a statement. Thanks, Tim. Yeah. Tell us what the, like, the operation systems like above, like you know, on top of mountains, right? Those people kind of like, spend a large fraction of their time like you know at high altitude, so you could do, oh, you could build like a little encampment like down in the mine. We go down and get experiment, right? <laughs> yeah, get, get like Starbucks down.